it's not just that we're a lived minority, that we have a lived experience in this country and in parts of the world of oppression. And when they come for you or her or they, they come for all of us. Hello, I'm Riyad Kalof and welcome to Standing Proud, the online series where I talk to some amazing queer people that discuss the journey through shame to triumph and to finding who they truly authentically are today. My guest is broadcaster, author, columnist, judge, TV judge anyway, barrister. It is Rob Rinder. Hello. Hi Riyad, how are you doing? I'm good. Uh, welcome to Standing Proud. Where, when was the first time you thought hang on, there's something different about me, that I'm not like the other mm. boys. It's really difficult to know when the formation of our identity occurs. It's different for different people. For me, you know, I'm, if I'm being a music about, musing about it, I always think to myself, it was the 70s and hoping people keep their food down. There I was, you know, <laughs> weed whacking my way out, turning around thinking, no, thank you, that's the end of that. Um, you know, being very conscious as a young, really young person of feeling like a foundling, yeah. Socially, culturally, I grew up in a very working class community, despite sounding like this. So people think that I must be terribly posh and sound like I was, because I sound like I'd be mugged by one of the Mitfords. But <laughs> this is, this is, you know, this is my own special creation. So always felt intuitively different, but probably knew in that sense of knowing and sense of attraction, sense of the difference that you're referring to, mm -hmm. sense of a confident idea and notion about my sexuality from about, you know, early teenagehood, I'd say. It doesn't sound like that idea uh, frightened you, though, like it did a lot of other people. It sounded like actually you wanted to dig deeper and discover, wait, what is this thing, rather than mm. run away from it. No, that's because I'm styling it out. Um, no, it's completely terrifying, of course. You? There's a moment, whenever that moment is, where you have to sit with yourself and have this, some might call it an epiphany, it's a moment of realisation that crushing oh shit moment when you're gay, right? It's not just about being different. You know, you are now required to hide mm. or to lie. Now, that was infinitely more pronounced when uh, I had that moment because, you know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s and I'm sure we'll come on to it, but it was at a time when um, being gay wasn't just different or challenging, it was dirty, furtive, wrong. and in school, for example, Section 28, it, it was illegal even to talk about. You couple that, you place that in the corrosive, malignant backdrop of HIV AIDS. And so it was a really frightening thing to have to come to terms with too. I didn't really suit the condition of childhood terribly well at 14, to be Likewise. I, I, I think I suited being right now ish yeah uh, probably actually more in, in 10 years i just I've, i was an adult in a kid's body and i think yeah. a lot of in particular gay men mm -hmm. associate with that because they they long to be an autonomous being that doesn't need to live under mom and dad's roof they long to have the security of knowing i am enough on my own maybe i think that's definitely part of it and as we would say, to build on that, I think, bearing in mind how unsafe you might feel, mm. that you have to, for survival, mm. cultivate, grow a degree of emotional intelligence, mm. an antennae around you to see who's accepting, who's not. So in the cases where I would meet somebody who might be homophobic in a leadership role, etc., I always understood and retain and maintain an understanding that people aren't born homophobic. Yes, learned behavior. Right. It's a series of things, cultural, societal, all of the things that inform prejudice. Mm. And so, depending, I always give people the gift of an opportunity to change. I love that. Can I just have a moment for that? Mm. Because I think that is how progress happens. Mm. When you go, right, what you just said to me, mm. or whatever, not ideal, not good, it's gonna impact me badly, mm. but you are a human being, you are flawed, let's see if we can work on this together mm. and give them that chance. Right. What Sorry. does the chance look like? It's a profound struggle in those circumstances to be kind enough to mm. yourself, to the other person, one might even say humanity, to go, okay, I 
hear you've said that. Now, I hear you. What you've just said has resulted in the deaths of thousands, if not in the world today, millions of people. Now, that's not going to touch aside. Let me tell you a story about how it felt when this happened to me. Anybody that's got residual energy, capital, currency, if you like, at the end of the day, or even whatever part of the day, to deploy hatred of any kind, to say that word, is not a happy human. No. You know, when you've had that gift of quite literally touching the face of the moral poverty of somebody mm. that's invested their life in espousing hatred, mm -hmm. you can see the human debris and detritus yes, around it, them. It, it infects a person's soul. Precisely. Doesn't it? And my response, once of course they understand that they're entirely wrong, I've explained to them how they're wrong, and they hopefully have come on a journey with me, is to feel that they're living in a perpetual sense of tragedy. And that always fuels me with a sense of optimism. Yeah. For me, it, it, probably three times in my life I've been confronted and I've been in that situation in London, in Dublin, and in all places, it's Swaziland. And just like you said, when I, I, you know, didn't react in the way they expected, which was back, they want that. When you react with, okay, and why did you say that? It worked every time. Mm -hmm. It opened a door for listening and they didn't walk away and say, I'll see you at Pride. But they, at, in one of the situations, I got a handshake and a sorry. Mm -hmm. In the other situation, I'd got just the sorry. And it was... There, there's, there are moments that I will take with me forever, and I always tell people, just mm -hmm. try it. Just try it, if it's safe, of course. Um, what did it do to you when somebody, that person said sorry to you? This was a small moment between two people that was really quite insignificant. But what can we learn from that? Can nations speak in this way? Mm. Nations at war? Can politicians, can, you know, can a, a husband and wife who are at odds, mm. or a husband and husband, whatever it is, it, it really, really was. I felt so enriched and I wanted to just leap on the person and hug them. And I, I know you called me that awful name, but look at you now. Ten minutes later. Wow, aren't we mm. great? I didn't do that, of course. But, um, yeah, it, it just shows that there is space for that, doesn't there? Allyship is a word that's thrown about, mm. especially this time of year. And especially in, in, you know, the corporate branded world, mm. you know, we have companies throwing a rainbow flag on something, but maybe not quite doing anything else. Don't care. What does allyship mean or look like to you? That. I don't care about people talking about virtue signaling as long as you're signaling virtue. You know, that message that you send out makes the world a little bit safer. I don't care if you're not doing more. I'd like you to do more. It's about the more people there, the better. Whilst they act as allies, they aren't standing as bystanders. And when they express that, for you and me, it might not be perfect, that's for sure. But if you're living in a part of the world or a part of the country or within the confines of a family where homophobia is writ large, mm. but the local bank that your parents use mm are prepared not to compromise and have a rainbow flag outside the business that your parents are going into, mm -hmm. that says to your parents, this is who we are, this is who we support. And just for a second, it makes life a little bit safer. Okay. It stands between the individual and the violence of the state, perhaps. I think the middle ground between you and I and our belief when it comes to allyship in the corporate world um, and beyond is that visibility and being not an enemy is better than being an enemy. I think that I expect a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that in a kind of an angry, why aren't you doing more? That's ridiculous. You mm -hmm. do it or you don't do it. I'm, I'm saying it in a way of, okay, I see how much you, Brand A, have grown from Pride 2017 to Pride 2021. Mm -hmm. That's great but we must keep on going. What's, the, what's your corporate responsibility? What are you right. doing with your staff? Do you have genderless toilets? You're, well, well, you're with me 100%. Okay. What you're talking about is complacency. Yes, we and, and bandwagoning and PRing the rainbow flag and um, lazy allyship. Mm. I think that, and, and also self-categorization mm. as an ally. No, no, no. 
the community says you're an ally or you're not, not you. And so I think that if we give an openness mm -hmm. to allow these brands to come on board and to learn and yeah. don't demand perfection now, right. like you said. Or people. Yeah, or, 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 or individuals, or then, it's, right. uh, then I think that that's the way. But a lot of them have, you know, it starts, right? It has to be a first step, right? So yeah, what would totally. we rather? We want, you know, you don't exclude people. You want them to be allies, right? Okay. You so, don't want to frighten them off. Right. So there <laughs> they are. And they're putting their uh, wallet where their gobs are and their reputations. And they're covering themselves in the rainbow flag. And they get virtue from it. And they may even get some financial benefit in a city like London. And like I say, that allyship has real benefits in real terms for the lived experiences of people yes. who are using services that matters right that's that's all true but what often happens and i can think of some corporate um play, you know, some places where i know this has happened banks etc is that um once a bank has done that that enables emboldens um people working in the banks for example to form LGBTQ um, societies. I can think, yes. for example, in the bank that my brother works in. It makes people feel safer and included. And also, you know, it takes members of the LGBT community, maybe it shouldn't, but it does, to be courageous enough to say, okay, you've done this. Um, so what I'd like in our bank or whatever it is, is for you to do the following. Um, and sometimes, of course, it's the path of least resistance. They can virtue signal but it takes somebody within that corporate community to go okay you've got to do more mm. and often that has happened and I, like i say I, I think it starts with those expressions mm. and then often that triggers difficult conversations and can really make um, meaningful change the hope is that when we come together as a united mm. voice that it's all going in that direction. Right. But what unites our community is a discussion that we need to have in a much more kind and inclusive way. Yes. W what, what do we share? And I shut my eyes and cast my mind back. We share one fundamental thing, which is that um, it's not just that we're a lived minority, that we have a lived experience in this country and in parts of the world of oppression. And when they come for you, or her, or they, they come for all of us. And until we acknowledge that yes. and stand shoulder to shoulder with one another, enveloped in that rainbow flag and understand what it means and the struggle, respect the struggle of what it took for us to be cloaked in that, mm. we're nowhere. I love and that. To th and to thank those people who got us there. You know, um, Peter Tatchell put his body physically Physically, he put his body so that I might be safe. So that young people in our LGBT communities might live in pride and free of shame. And I think about coming into LGBTQ week, Pride week, that I also think we must do better at remembering where those, we came from. Those who got us there in the first place. Who opened the doors. Right. I love that. Put their bodies on the floor for us. As a gay man who is fully rounded and seems to know himself inside and out, not going you're, you're not, you're, you know, yeah. W what would you say to that 14 year old mm. now uh, who was struggling with fear and shame? I would say to the 14 year old that was struggling with fear and shame, um, decloak yourself and um, remember that however painful it might be today, that once that's thrown off your shoulders. The sense of freedom, liberation, joy, delight, and possibility that living in truth gifts you. Quite literally standing in the blessing of sunshine, some people call it my truth, is such a rich gift that it outweighs even the thinnest benefit of living your life in shame, fear, and dishonesty. Ah, I feel lighter. Thank you so much, Rob. It's been a that gift. Was really beautiful. Thank you. Thank That's you. been a joy. I could talk to you forever. Anyway. You did. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs>